Hi, Evan. Thanks for joining us for this session Hello. today and for answering our questions. Hi, Sweta. It's great to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you. Um, I've always wanted to do this with you. Uh, but <laughs> <laughs> I was very passionate about applying to USC Marshall when I did. Um, yep. You were at the MBA tour when I was applying yep. and I came to the stand. I was all excited to go fight on and talk to you. That was also <laughs> the year that Marshall first achieved uh, gender equity in the classroom and I was applying. Yep. So it was a very exciting time. Uh, to be applying, I only heard great things about Marshall and my experience only compounded that. So very excited that you're here to talk to the people who are applying this year and to guide them through everything. Yeah, no, we're, we're happy to do this and it's a great opportunity. And hopefully when I met you uh, during the MBA tour, I was nice to you. I don't remember. <laughs> <That's> fantastic. <laughs> yeah. It's the people who apply who end up remembering who they spoke with, right? We yeah. The people in one night. <laughs> Sure, sure. Well, it's it's my pleasure. And again, thank you so much. Absolutely. So can you tell me a little bit more about the admission process? What do you think the applicants have to focus on this year when they are applying? Yeah, and, and uh, you know, there's a lot of detail we can go into. So let me kind of give you a broad overview first, and then we can we can take it from there if you want. And, you know, I think our admissions process, the way that I think about admissions uh, philosophically, and how we do it in practice is probably not too dissimilar than most of the other major programs. There, there might be some some nuances that we can talk about, though. Um, but you know, I I think that you know, when I when I think about candidates, um, my my feeling in my mind is that whenever I read an application, I always want to know um, that they can answer three questions predominantly. And, and hopefully the answer to those questions is a yes. Um, so, so, and, and these are fairly obvious, but it's worth getting into. I think the first is, uh, at a very fundamental level, we're an educational institution. So we want to make sure that everybody c coming in, uh, can perform well academically and, and, or at least with, you know, withstand the, the rigor of the program, um, in, in a lot of different dimensions. Um, and so one of the components is obviously in a very practical way, the data behind academics and, and, and th this is maybe the most objective part of the whole admissions. Uh, process, but we look at obviously um, academic history and, and test scores for that. And so, uh, if a person seems like they they're reasonably good at at those sorts of things, it probably gives us an indication that they'll also be reasonably good in the classroom, just from a pure uh, academic level. And if the answer to that question is yes, I put that to the side. And the second. Um, an independent question that I have is, do I think this person will be a great future professional, regardless of what they decide that they want to do? And really not just the first job out, but for the next 30 or 40 years of their professional life, that's a very different question than the academic question. And you can imagine there are plenty of people who are great um, students, but might find difficulty crafting a career for themselves and vice versa. You might find a person who will have a great career, but will struggle in the classroom. So that's why I say they're independent. And so for that, obviously we look at some past performance. Uh, what has a person's work experience been like? What is both the quality and quantity of that experience? Um, and perhaps what attributes and skills and talents they've accrued over time because of this experience that will benefit a future employer, but also perhaps benefit their classmates. Um, that's not quite as objective, though, because we're getting a lot of people from a lot of different backgrounds. It's easy to look at a transcript or a test score. It's a little bit more difficult to look at resumes and 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 try to look at those characteristics a student has from a professional perspective and then have it translated down the road. Because my question is not just have they been successful in the professional domain, but will they continue to be great at whatever they choose to do. And so that's kind of our projection into the future. But let's say the answer to that question is yes. Uh, then it becomes very subjective, <laughs> which is something a lot of students uh, have, uh, you know, a little fear about. But but it's all the other things that we ask for. Um, you write essays, you, you have interviews, um, and what beyond the data points of an application um, can you present as an argument to any admissions committee about why you deserve a, a seat in that class? And I think a lot of that has to do with what you bring to the table for the benefit of your classmates that may or may not be academic, it may or may not be even a professional skill, but something that, that allows you as the applicant to say, here's what I'm gonna bring to my teammates, 
to my group mates, to all the people within the Trojan community, um, and then perhaps by extension, some future employers. So, so as we go through those questions, um, it gets progressively more subjective, that's for sure. But the answer has to be yes to all those questions. So it can't just be that I've got good test scores, but I lack somewhere else because if, if or, or I have great experience, but I'm not gonna be a fit in the classroom. I mean, schools that get a decent number of applications will always have enough candidates who have pretty good scores, pretty good grades, pretty good experience. Then the question is, what else do you have? Right, right. That makes a lot of sense. Um, so how far back uh, are we looking for the answering the first question? Because I'm absolutely certain that people are going to ask me as yeah, a follow up yeah. to this conversation. The school grades matter when you're looking at the numbers. So we specifically look at um, what you've done after you've started college or university. So, so we don't go back before then. Um, and, and certainly some people come in with more than just a bachelor's degree or the equivalent of a bachelor's degree, they have a graduate work. But, but the most important consideration will be that bachelor's degree work. Um, and, and, and we will look at obviously the courses that a person has taken, uh, the, the grades that they received um, to get a sense of, of, of that part of the equation. And then if you have something more, whether it's graduate coursework or even professional certifications, that might also play into the, the question of how will you do academically? Right, right. That makes a lot of sense. So in a country yeah. like India, where you stress on academic performance, like from the yeah. get-go from your, when you're in kindergarten, I think it's a very common worry for people to worry about their school grades, even if they are 32 and 33 and are applying for an MBA sure. program. So sure. Yeah, um, no, no. And in, in, in different countries, we see different emphases placed on academics versus non-academics. Um, and again, you know, we're an educational institution, so we just want to make sure you're going to be able to form at least at a level of competency. <laughs> okay. um, another numbers related question, and that's about the GMAT or the GRE. Yeah. There's something that you prefer, and would you be able to share average or target score for Indian applicants? Can sure. I'll, I'll yeah. do my best uh, to be evasive. No, no. <laughs> no um, <laughs> I, so I, I think that... Um, there's no doubt that we accept plenty of both GMAT and GRE. Um, I would say, however, that we still get more GMAT uh, scores coming in than GRE scores. Uh, we probably, as an industry, still feel at least slightly more comfortable with GMATs because we have we have had a longer history. But but we have plenty of people who have submitted and been admitted to both, have received scholarships as well, uh, and that's true of both domestic and international students. Um, so so I think that my advice would be, you know, take a look at both exams and see which one you believe you're going to perform your best work at because that's really the deciding factor. You know, it, it's it's the it's ultimately the score the scores themselves that matter. My belief, or at least the the anecdotal evidence, suggests that the people who tend to like the verbal more than the quant might prefer the GRE. The people who like the quant more might prefer the GMAT. I don't know whether that's true or not, but I think a person, if they even just did a diagnostic on both exams, can can get a pretty good sense of the questions and where they will perform uh, you know, better or not. Um, now, the question of average test scores. So we're going to publish our class averages uh, probably within the next few days. So I'm going to kind of wait the, before I give you like a, an actual number because I'm I just want to do my final data verification, which is very important. Um, but but it's it's high. Um, the issue with Indian candidates is it tends to be that the average GMAT or even GRE scores are at least a bit higher than the average for the class. I, I think that's probably common across our industry if you work at a school that gets a lot of Indian applicants. So uh, certainly any applicant is compared across the entire pool, but we're also trying to diversify in a lot of different dimensions. One of those dimensions of diversity is country of origin or country of citizenship. And so if you get a lot of applicants from one particular country or or any, any particular group for that matter, you're also being judged against that group too. So, um, you know, our, our score you will find will be solidly in the, in this sort of 700s, um, but but I'll wait till you guys, uh, yeah, I, I want the applicants or the people watching the video to go to our website to take a look at what those averages are. But I, but I would say the class average is probably 
what any reasonable candidate should expect to look at. Of course, there's a very broad range. There's no doubt about it. And there are trade-offs that are made, of course. Now, if you go back to the, and I, I'm sorry to belabor this too much, but if you go back to my original questions that I said were independent, academics is independent from work experience, is independent from what I'll call fit. Um, the trade-off can be made within a category of information. So if a person has relatively weak academics, they can certainly try to strengthen their candidacy by doing above average on a test or vice versa. But what I would never ever do is say, you can overcome, for example, relatively weak work experience with a high test score or even a, a relatively low test score with great work experience because they measure different things. Okay, that's really... Um... A valuable bit of information for candidates to know because that's how we normally think. I have yeah. less than average work experience, so if I have a higher GMAT score, I'll be able to make up for it. Um, so it's good to know that that's not how commercial things are. Yeah, that's things. not how I think about it. Those those three independent questions all have to be sufficiently answered at yes or probably. <laughs> but but you know, I think I think looking at class profiles is something that any sort of a uh, serious MBA candidate is going to do anyway, because because you can get a pretty good sense from yourself, especially for those schools that provide ranges, whether it's the middle 80% or the overall range to give a, a sense of where you might fit in. Got it. Got it. Yeah. Um, so one more couple of, actually, all, most of my questions are about the application, but specifically sure. about the LOR component, the letter of yeah. recommendation. I know as a policy that USC Marshall is one of those rare schools that doesn't ask for LOR at all, if not the only school. Right. Um, what made you go in that direction and make that choice? <laughs> yeah, so I mean, this is one of my favorite topics, actually. And and so um, I'm probably one of the only uh, admissions uh, deans or directors who, who has adopted this particular um, strategy. Um, and I did this um, at a former institution where I worked and I carried it over when I came to USC as well. Um, there, there's a number of reasons why I've decided to remove it as part of the process. The first um, is that if you, again, are at a school that gets a sufficiently large number of applications, then you're getting a lot of very savvy MBA candidates. And the reality for me, at least as I've seen it, is that um, everyone who's a savvy MBA candidate will get very good letters of recommendation, at a minimum, very good, if not excellent. So the point of asking for a data point or any other thing that you might ask for in the admissions process is that it can serve as a differentiating point from one candidate to the next. But I have found that that's not really the case for 99% of our applicants who are viable candidates. They're all gonna get great letters of recommendation. So I, I wonder if it's, um, and I've always wondered whether it was something that that we could avoid asking for because the more you ask for the more cumbersome the process process becomes and that's the second reason um i don't want to put up barriers in front of candidates especially if i feel that asking this additional question or this additional data point won't make much of a difference for most of our decisions um and it's also um you know a, a sort of a encumbrance for the, the recommenders themselves. So, so it, it, it tends to delay the process in, in, in many respects, not only for the candidate, but for the recommender and for the institution as well. And you can imagine there are plenty of good candidates who ask for letters of recommendation and their recommenders are very busy people. Now that candidate may have submitted their application already. They want a decision as quickly as possible, but if we're waiting for one letter of recommendation, which to my mind may not make much of a difference anyway, I don't really wanna put that that delay in our process. And then the final thing I will tell you is we can't really do quality control on letters of recommendation. We don't go back and call the recommenders to say, did you write this letter of recommendation or not? Now, I don't wanna make it seem like there's a lot of cheating going on out there, but there are certainly instances where a recommender might be so busy, they might say to the person, well, I, I, I think you're great. You'd be a wonderful MBA candidate, but I'm really busy. Will you write a draft for me? I'll take a look at it and maybe make some edits and upload it. And and that to me is a relatively meaningless document. <laughs> uh, and so because we, we can't really do quality control on that, I hesitate to make that a significant part of our process. All right, that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah. Personally, based on my experiences, I uh, that's another reason that I vouch for this decision, that I would yeah. uh, support this decision to not have yeah. a letter of recommendation. Is there tons of students when preparing for the GMAT who come to me and ask, 
how do I ask my manager for a letter of recommendation when yeah. I have not told anyone at the office that I'm applying for an MBA sure. program? Sure. Right? Because if I don't get it, it's going to impact my performance review and everything. They're going to say, oh, you're going to leave. So why should I, you know? No, that's absolutely right. It, 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 it places, there, there's some risk involved, no doubt about it. And especially if a person has only had sort of working at one company, which is which frequently the case, you know, they can't go back to a former company to ask for one. And they, they hesitate to ask their, their boss or a supervisor um, for fear that there may, may be uh, sort of residual effects uh, that are negative. Yeah, yeah. I've actually seen a couple of people drop their plans to pursue an MBA because they're so yeah. afraid to go to the work organization and ask for a letter. For sure. So yeah, that makes, sense. that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Um, so when you see applications from around the world, across these three brackets about uh, yeah. you know, the quantitative aspects, the work experience mm -hmm. and the fit, is this something that you wish as a whole or in general patterns that you see, that you wish Indian applicants, you know, kind of did differently, handled a part of the application in a better manner. Could be yeah. the research part, could be the actual application, could be anything. So, so I, unfortunately, I think the answer is no. Um, I because I I think um, I I think our Indian candidates are. Um, as I said before, very savvy in many respects. Um, we see a lot of participation in things like the tours that we do when we do visit India. We see a lot of participation in our information sessions. Um, candidates from India tend, in my experience, to be very knowledgeable, not only about the pursuit of the MBA, but more specifically, the pursuit of the MBA at in individual institutions. Um, and so I, I I really can't can't think of anything that sort of places them in any kind of a, a disadvantage in how they present themselves in the application process. Um, I realize there's a tradition in India of, as you mentioned already, from a very young age, thinking about scores and grades and, and right. examinations that will get you to the next level and the next. Um, and, and, you know, that's important because we wouldn't be asking for test scores or grades if we didn't think they were important, but it's just not the only part of the process. I think there might be occasionally a hyper emphasis um, amongst some of our Indian candidates to think mostly about test scores. Um, now, I, I don't even want to make that blanket of a statement because I because I think, again, they're very savvy, but 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 it has to be a holistic approach. That's how we all do it. Um, and, and there isn't a sense of asking the question what's exactly the score I need in order to get the institution into, into your institution, because it just doesn't work that way. Right, right. That's kind yeah. of actually why I asked the question, because that's something I've noticed in MBA tours, that people go to the different uh, tables and ask, what's the exact score that I need? Yeah. And uh, sometimes that doesn't come across well, especially when you're talking to a lot of students and um, uh, everybody keeps asking the same question. So I have, as a, um, yeah. Participant of the fair, I have noticed some admission directors not handle that question well because they're like, "Why do you keep asking me the same thing?" Sort of a reaction. <laughs> so I thought we we could get it out of the way in this video. <laughs> yeah. They could do better justice to their prep and their interactions in the MBA tour. Well, and you might be describing me, so who knows? But um, <laughs> I, no, I, I I think. Well, so we do we do get a lot of the same questions. Look, it's a very legitimate question to to break down an application to look at the pieces of it and what do I need from an academic perspective? What do I need per, from a professional perspective? What do I need in terms of my interview? And those are all legitimate. Just because we keep hearing the same questions doesn't mean we we shouldn't we should dismiss them in any way. But I but I do think that w when we're talking about data points, you know, looking at class profiles is probably the right thing to do. Um, and and my 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 concern is always that I can't give a safe answer, right? If the you know what do I need to get in? The answer is there's no number that I could give you that would either guarantee your admission or guarantee your failure in the admissions process. Right, right, yeah. So are there um, truly bad questions that you think people should avoid asking? Or yeah, you could also yeah. talk about the really good ones too. <laughs> well, I, so I think the ones to try to avoid are ones that are a little more superficial in the sense that you could easily go to the website in, in either one or two clicks, get an answer. Because um, 
you know, I think any good admissions officer, especially if they're taking time with an individual to talk about a program, they they want a little bit more specificity. They want to have some feeling or some notion that the candidate has done at least a little bit of research um, beyond just kind of what it says on a profile sheet. And so I would avoid asking the questions that are that are they're important, but but they're the answers are readily available, you know, in another format. I think the the more specific questions that are ones that I think we generally have an interest in, and 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 are are kind of better for the candidate in, in some respects too is thinking about what you, the candidate, have done so far in your life. What has brought you to this point where you've decided perhaps to go pursue graduate management education and maybe even graduate management education at my particular school, right? So that means there's self-reflection that has that has taken place, both in terms of what they've studied, what they've done professionally, what they've done outside of the sphere of either work or academics, and then tailor the question to, well, this is who I am as a person so far in my life. This is what I'm trying to do. Can your school help me accomplish that? I, I think those are far more interesting than, you know, what's the average GPA, uh, right. you know, th things like that. Um, so hopefully that helps a little bit anyway. Yeah, I hope so too. Um, yeah. That's the list of questions I had. Is there anything else you wish I had asked you or anything else that you want to share with the candidates in general? Yeah, I think, um, I think what I'd share and the thing I, I like to talk about is, you know, each candidate wants to know how do I differentiate myself from the next person, the next, and and that can be a rather complicated problem, um, and it, it's not easy all the time because again, if you get enough applications to the school, a lot of people will have good test scores, good grades, good work experience. So the only thing you have left as a point of differentiation is either something you might write in an essay or something you might say in an interview. And so when I advise people, I, I tell them not to understate the importance of those more subjective pieces of the equation, because oftentimes the interview is the last thing that we do. And that's the make or break decision for any good candidate, because if they've gotten to the interview stage, we feel pretty comfortable about their academic ability and their professional experience. So again, back to the question, how do I differentiate myself? One way to think about it is, you know, we harass you with questions about what do you want to do with your life? What are your goals, short term, long term? A lot of people are pretty good at answering those questions from an employment perspective, uh, but then they stop there. But there's an implicit question that follows, and that is now that you've told me why you need us in order to pursue your dreams, why do we need you <laughs> is the real question. And the answer to that question I would submit is thinking about how you, the candidate, um, will bring something to the table again for your classmates and maybe even a future employer. So think about all of the skills and talents, the strengths and weaknesses, all, all the things that have brought you to this point that make you who you are. What above all else I would say to a candidate, do you think you're bringing to the person sitting next to you or, or, or in the group meetings or even outside of the classroom? And so that gives us a little bit more of um, an understanding of the person beyond just, again, the confines of data points. <laughs> Right, right. Yeah. Um, so a lot of people usually start by researching the program and the peer group and the class profile better in order to understand how their skills can to be yeah. transformed to make value, to contribute and create value for USA, right? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, there's a lot of good research to do. It's not just how does the curriculum align with what you're trying to do. Uh, we have, uh, like all schools, employment statistics report that gives people a sense of the companies with whom we partner, who hires our students in what areas by function, by industry, what their salaries and compensation packages are. So all of that also fits into the equation for the applicant about why would a school be either a good fit or a bad fit for me? And then beyond that, there's the culture and the community of the school. That's a little bit more difficult to get at the heart of. However, you can do it because all of us as schools provide you with points of contact, either our current students or alumni or faculty that you can reach out to to get an even better sense of what is it like on a day-to-day -day basis. And then geography may also play a part. It may be that you want to be either in a part of our country or in a part of the world that makes sense for you and your particular right. goals. Yeah, yeah. So are we going to meet you in person at the MBA Fair? So 
We'll be at, uh, we're doing two India trips this year. The first one, which I think is the one you're referring to, happens very shortly. The, I right. will not be there, uh, but there's a pretty good chance I'll be, I'll be in India in early December. Fantastic, fantastic. Yeah. Um, the year I applied you were in the first one and Nirav was in the second one. Um, and I had my yeah. in-person interview with Nirav and he came for the second MBA tour. Oh, good, yeah. Yeah, We. I mean, we love doing the interviews. To me, that's actually the most interesting part of the whole process. I understand it causes at least some amount of stress for some people. Uh, but my advice, maybe in closing here, is treat that as an opportunity to learn more about the school. You're interviewing us as much as we're interviewing you, in a sense. Make sure, because if you have a bad interaction um, with the school through an interview, it doesn't necessarily mean that you'll have a bad experience, but it should give you at least some indication of your comfort level with either the representative of the school or maybe even the place itself. So, so try to take those um, as, as a, as a two way street and not just an authority figure harassing you with questions. And, and most of these questions are, are very basic. Um, they're, they're not um, technical in nature and they certainly allow us to get at the heart of the person beyond just what they've presented in the application. Okay, that's fantastic. Thank you so much for taking your time and doing sure. this. I really appreciate having this conversation with you. Yeah, well, hopefully it's helpful to those of you who might watch it. Uh, we, we'd love to have you consider us uh, in, in your school subset of schools to which you might apply. But either way, good luck with the whole process. And as we say at USC, fight on. Fight on, absolutely. Thank you, Sweta.